This is Doug Nijame. I'm the faculty director of the Williams Institute and also a professor of law at UCLA. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today uh, for uh, this webinar. Um, the webinar uh, is dedicated to uh, the landmark article by Nan Hunter and Nancy Polakoff, Custody Rights of Lesbian Mothers, Legal Theory and Litigation Strategy, which was published 40 years ago in the Buffalo Law Review. And so on the anniversary of this uh, really important uh, piece of legal scholarship, uh, we're taking time to reflect with the authors, uh, as well as some of the leading voices in LGBT family law um, about how things have changed in the past four decades and what we've learned and what the most pressing issues going forward are as well. Um, in the article, uh, Nancy and Nan uh, take time to walk us through custody disputes in which lesbian mothers are having uh, their parental fitness questioned based on their sexual orientation, both uh, in conflicts with uh, spouses upon divorce from different sex marriages, uh, as well as in conflicts with the state or uh, with third parties. Uh, and then they lead us through uh, litigation strategy on how lawyers uh, should approach uh, conflicts dealing, uh, addressing sexual orientation and uh, lesbian mothers. And in some ways, we have many more kinds of disputes that are arising involving LGBT parents um, that pose new issues, some of which we'll explore. And in other ways, we still see some of these same issues arising, including in the area of litigation over transgender parents. And so we'll surface some of those issues as well. I'm going to take just a couple minutes to introduce our uh, presenters and um, talk about format, and then I will turn it over um, to begin our presentation. So uh, we're very fortunate to have both Professor Hunter and Professor Polakoff with us. Um, Professor Hunter is Professor of Law at uh, Georgetown um, and is also uh, affiliated with the Williams Institute. She's been a visiting professor uh, at UCLA School of Law and long served as the Legal Scholarship Director at the Williams Institute. Uh, professor Nancy Polakoff is Professor of Law at American University Washington College of Law and has also been long affiliated with the Williams Institute um, and in fact for um, a year and a half served as the McDonald Wright uh, Faculty Chair in Law at UCLA School of Law and at the Williams Institute uh, and we'll be back in that capacity in the spring uh, at UCLA. Uh, our two um, uh, commenters uh, include Professor Kim I. Pearson, who is Associate Dean for Faculty Research and Development and Associate Law Professor at Gonzaga University School of Law. Um, Kim was a Williams Institute Law, Law Teaching Fellow um, before she began her, her academic career at uh, Gonzaga, and so it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Kim back to Williams Institute. And finally, we have Courtney Jocelyn, who is Professor of Law at UC Davis School of Law, um, one of the leading scholars in the country on questions of LGBT family law. Um, during the uh, webinar, you can write questions in the chat box that appears, uh, and we will see those questions and likely address them in the question and answer period that we reserved for the end of the hour. But if there's questions that are uh, points of clarification for uh, material that our presenters are moving through at that particular moment, we might also direct the question to the presenter at that time. So feel free as we go along um, to write questions into the chat box um, on the webinar, and we'll be sure to log those. Um, so we're going to uh, start it off at this point um, with uh, Professor Nan Hunter. Nan. Thank you, Doug. On behalf of Nancy and myself, I want to begin by thanking the Williams Institute, especially Brad Sears, for this event recognizing whatever role our article was able to play in enhancing the rights of lesbian mothers especially and also gay fathers. The article was our opening shot, so to speak, in careers that we both wanted to dedicate to social justice. And it is immensely gratifying to think that the article had an effect. We also want to thank Kim Pearson and Courtney Joslin, leaders in the current generation of LGBT family law scholars for contributing to this webinar, 
Doug Najame of UCLA for herding the cats to make it happen, and Michael Allen and Noel alumnant of the Williams Institute for actually putting it together. In preparing for this webinar and rereading the custody rights article, I was struck both by how far the field has come and also by how certain core themes in somewhat new forms persist. So I'm going to focus my remarks on how the dimensions of the field have expanded and how the harms discourse that continues to haunt lesbian moms and gay dads has evolved. So first, the numbers. Thanks to a 2010 article by Professor Cliff Roski of Utah Law School, there is a published list of all reported LGB custody cases from 1951, the first, to 2007. So, deploying my skills in advanced mathematics, I counted them and produced this graph. The top light blue line is lesbian mother cases. The second darker line is gay father cases. You can see the clear upward trajectory and the number of cases. Uh, they are plotted in five-year increments. From decade to decade, however, um, you uh, would note um, that um, uh, they double in number from decade to decade. Uh, by the end of uh, all of this time, uh, cumulatively, there are pretty much exactly twice as many lesbian mom cases as gay father cases. As we know, though, reported cases tell you only so much. A great deal about the social dynamics of this kind of litigation for the families, the judges, the political culture of the jurisdiction is invisible. When I looked at the trajectory of increasing numbers of cases, I wondered about who the litigants were and whether the lesbian moms and gay dads in today's cases may be different in their racial and economic characteristics, for example, than the litigants in the 1970s and early 80s. We know from the work of Williams Institute scholars that LGB families in which there are children are disproportionately composed of people of color. Are custody disputes in families of color or in modest income families resolved in different ways or in different venues than in white, more economically secure families? And if so, how do those differences affect the lives of the parties and their children? Another dimension that I wondered about was whether the engagement with LGB custody issues has spread geographically, affecting a broader range of judicial systems. And geography is something that one can learn from case reports. So here you see the percentage of cases, um, the growing percentage of cases in the South. Now, a caveat, this is a universe of small numbers, so that changes may look overstated from the point of view of statistical significance. But we do see an increasing presence in these cases in at least one region of social conservatism, the South. Overall and in the aggregate, the diffusion of the issues and narratives that arise from LGB custody litigation is a good thing. Some cases in the South, for example, may have been considered too hopeless to even litigate in the 1970s. Of course, for the individuals in these cases, the effects of litigating outside America's blue zones may well be negative. But I do think that the chart tells us that a geographic diffusion of LGB legal issues has occurred in the United States, including in the state trial courts, the level of the judiciary with which Americans are most likely to come in contact. To put these points uh, in further context, I included the next slide prepared by Gary Gates showing the geographic dispersion and points of concentration of LGB families raising children. You will see that the map depicts concentrations in some of what are thought to be the less likely areas for quote unquote gay America. Look at California, for example, where the concentration is lighter on the coast than it is in the inland. Or look just generally at the south, which has a pretty deep color of concentration. Um, this slide correlates quite closely with the population concentrations of LGB people of color. On the next slide, the Williams Institute data 
note the data on the left at this point, documents that LGB Americans are indeed more likely than the population as a whole to be people of color and more likely than the population as a whole to have lower incomes. We now have information, in other words, that did not exist when Nancy and I wrote the article that could help lead us to a much richer account of LGB custody disputes, including how racial, economic, and geographic factors may shape the experiences of LGB parents with the legal system. And I hope family law scholars continue this work. Now I want to turn to recurring issues in the content of this group of custody cases. To put this set of questions in context, the major goal of the original article was to call for adoption of a nexus test in all LGB custody disputes. That is, a rule that the court would not consider a parent's homosexuality unless and until the opposing party had introduced it or had introduced reliable evidence that the particular child or children would, would be harmed by the parent's sexual orientation. The threshold requirement of a nexus test was designed to eliminate or at least curb arguments that an LGB parent was automatically disqualified from winning custody on the grounds of immorality or criminal conduct. Over time, the arguments used against LGB parents as a group have become somewhat more subtle. And I group the current, what I would call accusations directed against LGB parents in three categories. Will their children be subject to greater stigma? Will the influence of an LGB parent make it more likely that their children are LGBT? And will the influence of an LGB parent make it more likely that their children adopt less gendered modes of behavior? For all of these questions, again, we now have a body of social science research that was non-existent when Nancy and I wrote the original article. So let's begin with stigma. The question is whether children of LGB parents will be more likely to have to endure bullying and teasing from their peers. And the results are mixed. Some studies do show a greater risk of stigmatization, others not. We see that certain external factors have a significant impact on bullying. Children and families who live in more cosmopolitan locations and who attend more progressive schools tend to be less at risk. This suggests that lawyers counsel LGB parents to try to make such arrangements if possible. And if possible is a big caveat because as a practical matter, significant financial means may be necessary. For most parents, the quality of the parent-child relationship may be the best lens through which to address this issue. Next, the child's sexual orientation. Again, mixed answers to a loaded question. There are studies indicating that children of LGB parents are less likely to be exclusively heterosexual. That appears to be most likely to be true for daughters of lesbian mothers. And there's a fascinating broader context for this particular issue. On the next slide, as you can see from the right-hand side of the slide that we had seen before, the percentage of all young adult women in the US who self-identify as LGBT is now more than 8%, a major increase over prior age cohorts. So here one might argue that the overall norm is changing in the direction of daughters of lesbian mothers, making them at least somewhat less atypical and definitely less atypical than their own mothers are compared to an older age cohort. The last issue is gender norms. We see the pattern as for the other two questions. The studies so far have produced mixed results on the question of whether children of LGB parents are less likely to exhibit gender traits in play and other activities, even at very young ages, than other children. And of course, the causal intuition suggests the effect of LGB parents as role models. These are the big battleground questions, sometimes explicit, sometimes implicit, that continue to lurk in LGB custody disputes. 
And of course, they share a common structure. We know that especially the second two of these three points are really today's version of immorality arguments. And they raise a question that underlies the entire field. Should plausible, even provable, instances of deviancy from an empirical norm be treated as legitimate considerations in a custody case? Harm is not the same thing as atypicality. And what is the best protection for the LGB parent who faces litigation when these issues arise? We now argue not just that there should be a nexus test, but that evidence of a parent's sexual orientation per se is irrelevant. Custody decisions are state actions, which taken together can comprise a pattern of channeling or shaping lives, whether done with the goal of suppressing nonconformity or with more well-intentioned motivations. Family court rulings can have the effect of trenching on core liberty interest, as well as equality concerns. At stake is the child's freedom to emerge as part of a sexual majority or sexual minority without interference by the state. Although arguing for constitutional rights is not a good strategy in individual cases, we as scholars and practitioners should be alert for opportunities to point out these broader ramifications of custody disputes. And with that, I turn the discussion over to Nancy. Thank you, Nan. Um, the cutting edge of the law affecting lesbian mothers today lies not in the cases that Nan and I wrote about 40 years ago, but in disputes that call into question the definition of parent, questions like when does intent or conduct create parentage in the absence of biology, or can a child have three parents or four? But the increased visibility and acceptance of same-sex relationships has not stopped the phenomenon we described in the 1970s, a man or woman entering a heterosexual marriage, having children, and only later coming out as gay or lesbian. The formal law has changed. No state now asserts that a parent in a same-sex relationship is per se unfit. In fact, all states say that a parent-same-sex relationship itself is not sufficient reason to deny that parent custody. Yet such parents continue to have reasons for concern in contested cases, even in states with overall support of law. So in the short time I have here today, I'm going to describe one such case and mention the reasoning of others. And I also want to take special note of the vulnerability of transgender parents. Last month, the Washington State Supreme Court heard argument in Black v. Black. Charles and Rachel Black were married for roughly 20 years and had three sons. They raised the children in a conservative Christian home and the children attended conservative Christian private schools. Rachel was a stay-at-home mom. When the children were about 12, 9, and 4, Rachel told Charles she was a lesbian. Up through the end of the divorce proceedings, three years later, the parents lived within the same home in, in separate sleeping quarters, although Rachel began a relationship with a woman. The parents each requested the equivalent of primary physical custody and decision-making authority over education. Rachel wanted the children to attend public school rather than a school that teaches that homosexuality is a sin. I'm sure you can see where this is going. The guardian ad litem criticized what she referred to as Rachel's choice to leave the marriage and live with a female partner and said that that choice caused controversy and confusion. Although the state allowed a court to consider, a, the statute allowed a court to consider the child's religious beliefs in deciding custody, there was actually no evidence presented about the children's actual religious beliefs. Rather, the trial court said that the father was the more stable parent because he would remain in the family home, keep the children in the same school, and maintain their religious upbringing. The court also ordered no contact with Rachel's partner and no exposure to anything involving homosexuality 
until approved by the children's therapist. Washington State has long had law prohibiting restrictions based on a parent's sexual orientation. And a trial court can't impose restrictions that are designed to, quote, artificially ameliorate changes in the child's life, or simply because the court thinks the restrictions will make the post-marriage transition easier for the child. Because of this, the Court of Appeals overturned the trial court's imposition of restrictions. But it did uphold the decision giving primary physical custody to Charles, finding no abuse of discretion, and specifically crediting the GAL's recommendation based on the children's need for stability. It also upheld Charles's sole decision-making authority on the children's education, thereby guaranteeing that they will remain in a school environment that teaches uh, them that their mother is sinful. It's that appeals court ruling that is currently before the Washington Supreme Court. Notably, Charles does not maintain in his brief, nor did his attorney at oral argument, that there's any problem with Rachel being a lesbian, nor does he seek to reimpose restrictions on her visitation. Charles once referred to Rachel as a militant lesbo, but he later said he regretted that comment and that it was made out of anger and hurt. He now focuses completely on the argument that custody with him serves the best interests of the children, given the upbringing they re received during the marriage and their need for stability. But completely absent from the court rulings to date in this case and others, is any articulation of a heterosexual parent's obligation and responsibility to assist the children in adjusting to having a gay or lesbian parent. Charles quotes the GAL's position that keeping the children in their schools was, quote, safe from an emotional perspective. But this is a twisted conception of emotional safety one that ignores the teaching the children receive in school about their mother. In a number of other cases within the past decade, appeals courts have upheld custody awards to a heterosexual father over a lesbian mother based on a child having a difficult time adjusting to the mother's same-sex relationship or even just feeling uncomfortable around the mother's partner. Now, there's no doubt that some children do feel this way, but not one opinion describing such facts places responsibility for the child's difficulties on a heterosexual parent who refuses to assist the child's adjustment to a new reality. A gay parent can be faulted for allegedly placing her own needs above her child, while no heterosexual parent has been faulted for placing his needs above his child when he fails to ease the child's acceptance of the mother's new relationships. Until courts do assess the non-gay parent's suitability based on his willingness to facilitate the child's acceptance of having a gay parent, lesbian mothers and gay fathers remain vulnerable to losing custody and facing visitation restrictions. Perhaps the most I'm willing to say today is that when a parent has stable employment and housing and has not had multiple partners, and when her children show no signs of distress and do not oppose remaining with her, then she can be more confident than her partners 40 years ago. In the absence of any of those factors, she still faces, in more subtle ways, the vulnerability we wrote about. I also want to alert everyone to a possible future issue. Until the last few years, disapproving courts have been able to lump all same-sex relationships with unmarried different sex relationships and to restrict a child's exposure to any non-marital partner, something courts have repeatedly said is distinct from the parent's sexual orientation. Now that all same-sex couples have the option to marry, we may see overt disapproval of those who fail to do so. For my second point today, I want to talk about parents who transition after or at the time of divorce. We reported in our 1976 article about the case of Christian v. Randall. In that case, a mother had custody of her four daughters and then transitioned. 
a Colorado trial court changed custody of the children to their father against their wishes. The appeals court reversed, finding that the, quote, transsexual change had had no adverse impact on the children. I could never have imagined that 40 years later, that case would remain the single most definitive victory for a transgender parent in a contested custody dispute. Notable in the case, however, is that the children were all thriving and wanted to remain with their mother. Those factors are not dependably true in any child-related dispute, let alone one involving children's reactions to a parent's gender transition. I can't be too blunt about this. Transgender parents are facing a landscape much like the one gay and lesbian parents faced 40 years ago. In the section of our article on litigation strategy, we began with the recommendation that the case be kept out of court. If you open the fine materials available today to assist transgender parents and their attorneys, like Jennifer Levy's Transgender Family Law, you will find the same advice. A necessary component of such a strategy includes careful consideration of how both the spouse or ex-spouse and the children are made aware of the impending transition. There are minefields everywhere. In one case, a nine-year-old child went to visit her father out of state, observed his feminine features, and told her mother she did not want to visit again. The mother made no effort to assist the child's acceptance of having a transgender parent. <coughs> Excuse me. The child did not see her father again until the day six years later <coughs> when she testified in court that she wanted to be adopted by her father's husband so she could, her mother's husband, so she could have a real father. <coughs> the effect of that adoption was to terminate the rights of the transgendered parent, which the court did by finding by clear and convincing evidence that the parent had inflicted emotional injury on the child. In another case where a mother and father began with 50-50 joint physical custody, the mother filed for sole custody based solely on the father's transgender status and impending gender reassignment surgery. The trial court granted the mother's petition, once again invoking the children's need for stability <coughs> and noting that the impact of the father's upcoming surgery was, quote, uncertain. <coughs> but no doubt mindful that the legal standard did not permit modification based on transgender status alone, the trial court made some other factual findings in its order. This allowed the appeals court to affirm, citing the ubiquitous no abuse of discretion standard and provoking a scathing dissent. The positive trajectory for gay and lesbian parents over the last 40 years may be a harbinger that transgender parents will find greater acceptance in the future but recognizing the circumstances under which gay and lesbian parents remain vulnerable is cautionary and reinforcing the importance and reinforces the importance that all such parents find well-prepared counsel before a dispute with a former spouse escalates into contested litigation. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy, uh, and thanks to Nan, uh, two really uh, informative and insightful discussions. We're going to hear from our uh, commenters now, and we're going to start with Professor Kim Pearson. Kim. Thank you, Doug. I'm so honored to have this opportunity to talk about Nan and Nancy's work that is groundbreaking and important. So for some, legal scholarship can seem somewhat removed from litigating cases and community organizing, but today I'm going to share three perspectives about how scholarship is of use in advocacy and how these three perspectives are exemplified uh, by the work that Nan and Nancy did in their article. The first is academic activism, so really groundbreaking work that has happened in the past. The second piece is legal history intervention that we can do now. And third is we can use the article as a guide to transformative advocacy in the future. Uh, next slide, please. 
This is an excerpt from Robin West and Danielle Citron making the case for legal scholarship. I'd like to highlight a couple of points about scholars whose work tells us what the law should be. The first is that scholars have this ability to see cases at a remove, and this becomes quite beneficial. And uh, their scholarship is based on the principle that the work of justice is in the purview and reach of the law. Nan and Nancy's work exemplifies these principles. Next slide, please. Their article compiled and compared legal reasoning used by courts to explain moving children from fit mothers to less fit fathers, or in some cases, grandparents or other third parties because of the mother's sexual orientation. This was critically important work that revealed each result couldn't just be explained away as, oh, that was one bad judge, or something the mom did was wrong, or you just had bad luck. By drawing all of the cases together, they were able to determine that advising clients to settle out of court, if at all possible, could in some ways be much less risky for lesbian mothers. And finally, the case studies showed that courts were unfairly using social and moral disfavor as a measure for the best interests of the child or parental fitness. Instead of using rational and predictable grounds for awarding custody, the cases they drew together illustrated courts that uh, made decisions on arbitrary grounds such as moral panic or social disfavor. Next slide, please. The next piece is legal history intervention. Not that long ago, Michelle Bachman made a statement about African American families being more cohesive during slavery. And Patty Limerick came up with this concept that historians should be able to jump in as first responders when uh, something from the past disturbs the present. And usually it's in service of uh, promoting uh, further bias or some other sort of unjust result. In Nan and Nancy's work, next slide please, They've given us a really important record of overt bias. It's a reminder, it's also a milestone marker for tracing advocacy accomplishments. This article teaches those growing up now in an era when same-sex marriage seems fair and sensible instead of impossible about the struggle against bias and discrimination. This article counters revisionist history that could be used to, d to obscure past bias and justify ongoing or new forms of bias. We can't downplay or ignore bias because we have an actual record. Another way this legal history intervention works is that it gives us context. So we can resist the temptation to believe that same-sex advocacy victories in marriage means that bias and discrimination against all LGBT individuals just magically disappears. Um, so an example of this is courts can say they're neutral or they're not considering a parent's sexual orientation or gender identity, but then may use stereotypes or coded language to express disfavor or moral disgust and use that to find the LGBT parent is unfit. So in order to resist these new and subtle forms of bias, it's really critical to have the kind of record and analysis that Nan and Nancy's article provides. Um, this, slide, this statement from Dean Spade is a good reminder to keep doing transformative advocacy. And especially now that we're walking into a socially conservative, conservative regime, um, we have to be aware of the co-opting of progressive language in order to allow uh, things that support the status quo to go on. So an example of that would be um, using personal choice and free market language to allow predatory lending and other forms of economic exploitation to go unpunished. Nan and Nancy's article exemplifies this work and sets the foundation for uh, the future of grassroots advocacy. It's first of all attuned to connecting legal theory with practice. So this article is a bold vision of scholarly work as a part of the grassroots advocacy that characterized early parenting equality efforts. It's also an exemplar of sharing resources. In this case, the resources are the ability to gather and analyze cases and then to share practice strategies with others. This work also points to coalition building across race, class, and geographic lines. Finally, their work engages with constitutional law questions about parenting and identity groups and really sets the stage for evolving forms of civil rights advocacy. Their work expands notions of where so social justice work can take place by focusing on familiar settings that are relatable for a lot of people. In conclusion, Nan and Nancy's article has enduring value because of its groundbreaking advocacy work and its ability to stretch across time and continue to inspire.
So thank you, Nat and Nancy. Thanks, Kim, for those uh, really uh, interesting and inspiring uh, comments about uh, Nan and Nancy's work. And finally, we're going to hear from Professor Courtney Jocelyn. Great. Um, thanks so much for having me. And in my few minutes today, I want to try to do two things. First, I want to take this opportunity to thank Nancy and Nan for their incredible work over the last 40 years. LGBT people everywhere are indebted to you for helping to bring about really remarkable changes in the law. And then time permitting, I want to close by talking a little bit about some emerging family law custody issues that we're seeing today that Nancy alluded to earlier. But first, the thanks and the gratitude. As Nan and Nancy wrote in their article, 40 years ago in 1976, a lesbian mother was at significant risk of losing custody of her own child, even if the person on the other side was someone other than a parent. Time and again, they explained, courts presumed that LGB parents were unfit simply because they were LGB. As Nan and Nancy point out, challenges still remain, and the victories are not evenly felt by all people or across all parts of the country. But that said, the reality today is that due in no small part to their scholarship and their advocacy, that is no longer the law in this country. Today, most jurisdictions at least purport to apply the very nexus test that Nan and Nancy urged them to adopt, a test that requires a showing that a parent's sexual orientation is actually causing harm to a child before the court is permitted to take into account the parent's sexual orientation. And, you know, I think many who practice or write in this area are aware of the role that Nan and Nancy played in shifting this body of custody law. But I think one thing that people don't fully appreciate is how their advocacy in this particular area of child custody law served as a critical stepping stone to other advancements in the law, including advancements with respect to constitutional doctrine. To those who are familiar with this article, this claim may seem surprising. In their article, Nan and Nancy had, had expressly urged custody litigants not to rely on constitutional claims. They recognized that although constitutional claims may be flashy, they aren't always a winning strategy. But their goal was to create a winning strategy for real people and real parents. And fortunately, many attorneys listened to their advice and they focused on the facts of the particular family before the court. And as a result, at least over time, many of their clients prevailed. And if those attorneys had pressed those equal protection sexual orientation arguments in the 1970s and 1980s, not only would their clients likely have lost, but they might have set back the law for LGBT rights generally. So if Nan and Nancy weren't urging an expressly, if they were urging an expressly non-constitutional litigation strategy, how did these custody cases lay the groundwork for the more recent constitutional victories? Um, and, and I think here we have to look at what our opponents have been arguing. Across contexts, opponents of LGBT equality have relied very explicitly on arguments about children. If we think about the marriage equality context, for example, Initially, opponents argued that children would be harmed if they were raised by LGBT parents, and then later they made a slightly different claim that the ideal setting for the raising of children is a married household with biological and presumably straight mothers and fathers. But of course, the hurdle for opponents are the facts. First, the fact that according to the Williams Institute, six million children and adults in the U.S. have an LGBT parent. And um, due in part to the work of Nancy and Nan, many of these children were living with and were being raised by their LGBT parents. And second, dozens of studies examined the outcomes for these kids who were being raised by their LGBT parents. Nan noted there's some evidence that these kids might be less gender conforming, but what is absolutely clear is that these dozens of studies consistently find that having a gay or lesbian parent does not harm children. And because of these realities, realities that came to pass because of successful child custody advocacy, opponents were simply unable to offer a plausible, non-discriminatory justification for marriage bans. And in this way, Nan and Nancy's advice to avoid constitutional arguments in those early custody cases was not only critical to the positive advancement in the law governing child custody, it also produced case law and families that were actually critical to the positive development of constitutional doctrine with respect to LGBT people. And again, um, to be sure, this work is not done. As Nancy explained, even for LGB parents, 
Litigation and challenges continue, and for trans parents, there is much, much work to be done. But without question, the legal landscape, at least for LGB parents, is much less bleak than it was in 1976. And we are very grateful for your efforts to bring about this change. And then finally, before I pass over the mic, I wanted to say a few words about a different type of custody case that we're seeing today that Nancy alluded to earlier. And here I'm talking about custody disputes between former same-sex partners. So we're talking about a case where we have a same-sex couple, a lot of these cases involve lesbian couples, who had a planned child together, often, although not always, through assisted reproduction. And then after parenting the child together for some time, the couple breaks up and the biological parent seeks to cut off contact between the child and the non-biological parent. In the past, the biological parent was often successful. In many of these cases, courts held that the non-biological partner was a legal stranger to their child and had no right to seek custody or visitation. And this indeed was the law in the state of New York until about three months ago under the Allison D decision. In Allison D, a non-biological parent sought to maintain a relationship with a child that she had co-raised for about six years. And in its 1991 decision, the New York High Court infamously held that although the non-biological partner nurtured a close and loving relationship with the child, she was not a parent and therefore had no right to even ask a court for custody or visitation. But fortunately, and here again, it is due in no small part to the leadership and advocacy of Nan and Nancy, much has changed on this front as well. For couples who are married and who use assisted reproduction consistent with the law and the state, both parties have strong arguments that they are legal parents of any resulting child. And while the law isn't as protective for unmarried couples, we're also seeing development here too. About 10 states now have assisted reproduction statutes that apply equally to married and unmarried couples. And where these statutes apply, both members of the couple, again, regardless of their marital status, are considered the legal parents of a child born to them through assisted reproduction. And even where the non-biological parent is not considered a legal parent, in the majority of states today, she at least has a right to maintain a relationship with the child if the adult's relationship ends. And again, this isn't true in all states, but in many states, advocates and litigants are slowly and steadily helping courts to see what Nancy carefully explained in her groundbreaking 1990 Law Review article entitled, This Child Does Have Two Mommies. In that article, Nancy explained how the law can and why it must protect children's existing and bonded parent-child relationships, even when these relationships are not based on marriage or biology. And indeed, 25 years after issuing the decision in Allison D., the New York High Court finally recognized just earlier this year that the Allison D. decision was unworkable and harmful to children. So I'll conclude here by repeating myself and again offering my thanks and my gratitude to Nancy and Nan for their years of leadership, for their advocacy, for their perseverance, traits that we all surely need in the coming years. Thanks, Courtney. Um, thanks to Nan and Nancy and Kim and Courtney for a really rich uh, set of analysis and comments. Um, at this point, uh, I would encourage uh, folks who are listening to the webinar to type into the chat function any questions you might have for the panelists uh, individually or as a group um, if you have questions for them and we can get to those questions. Also, I want to make folks aware that the PowerPoint slides will be available, um, including the slides with uh, data from the Williams Institute that Nan referred to, um, and the uh, article, the article that we're celebrating here today will also be avail made available. Um, it should be uh, linked from the chat function and also can be uh, sent out separately as well. Um, so I'll, we'll wait to see if questions are coming in, um, but uh, I wanted to give the panelists, the commenters and, and authors um, an opportunity to respond to one another if they, uh, if they wanted to. So does anyone want to um, respond to anything that someone else uh, said? Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, well, I would. I mean, first, I just have to thank Kim and Courtney for the for the generosity uh, and kindness of their comments, um, and uh, and and express just how much you know how gratifying it is, and how much I and I'm sure 
Nancy as well um, appreciate that. Um, the, I mean, one of the interesting dynamics for me personally that the opportunity of this celebration um, uh, yeah, provides is, um, is a chance to kind of reflect back on a career um, that uh, has included both uh, advocacy and full-time advocacy jobs as well as academic jobs. And I know that's been true for Nancy as well and for Courtney and Kim, I think your, your time at Williams should count as well. And I'm, um, I'm guessing, uh, and just from glancing at some of the names, that a number of people who are um, signed in today um, also have, that, have had that experience. Um, and it, the, um, the value of, um, uh, to oneself and one's own um, intellectual growth, as well as whatever value uh, this article has had in, in, in a broader sense, um, I would just encourage people, uh, including independent scholars, uh, to continue to, to work in this field and in related fields and to, to publish work on these issues. Thanks, Dan. Um, um, also, this is Nancy, and I, I would like to echo Nan's thanks. I, I find it a little um, daunting, actually, when I think about uh, m my career spanning over 40 years. Um, but I, I think one of the things that's happening uh, and I sort of alluded to this at the beginning of my comments, is that there, there's a lot of attention to what are these hot, cutting-edge legal issues about defining parentage in planned um, families involving same-sex couples or uh, those in anything other than a married, heterosexual, biological, parenthood-related families. And uh, and I'm very excited by those issues, those cutting edge issues also. But the day-to-day -day work of family law still involves these disputes where a parent has a child in a heterosexual marriage and then comes out and something has to be done to address the, the care of those children post-divorce. And for all of the lawyers in the country who do that work, it may not look like the cutting edge work it might have looked like um, 40 years ago, but it is work that affects the daily lives of gay and lesbian people in the most profound possible way. And so uh, I hope that um, our work inspires that the most controversial aspect of getting our law review article published in 1976 was not that it was about the custody rights of lesbian mothers. It was mm -hmm. about the fact that we wanted to include litigation strategy as part mm -hmm. of our article, that we in fact refused to publish the article um, in a journal that didn't want to include litigation strategy as part of it but it was the litigation strategy part that we thought would be of most assistance to lawyers all over the country who were starting to see these cases. And we have a lot more of those lawyers, and they know a lot more than they did, and some of them have great, many of them have great expertise in this area. Um, but it's really to those lawyers that gay and lesbian parents owe the, um, the successes that make it possible for them to live f fulfilling lives as openly gay individuals and parents. Thanks, Nancy. Um, I've been told that the link to the webinar will be available uh, next week on the Williams Institute website. So for folks who want to um, have access to it or send it to others, that will be available next week on the Williams Institute website. Um, both Nancy, in your comments, you mentioned uh, thinking about the future and in increasing interest in three parents. And Courtney, your comments, you talked about the importance of recognizing the relationship between someone who might not be biologically related to the child, but has formed a relationship with them. So as we think about having to um, 
work towards standards that allow us to recognize existing relationships, potentially even when there's already two legally recognized parents. Um, I'm wondering if you can just either Courtney or Nancy or both speak for a couple minutes about what the state of the law is with regard to more than two parents and where you see this going. Nancy, in, in one of the seminal articles that Courtney mentioned, um, uh, you talked about third parent adoption. And in some ways, this is thinking about whether we have a system or will have a system that will let us recognize three legal parent-child relationships. You know, I think what's very interesting about that question is that, of course, it, it's um, a legal issue that affects um, those in different sex relationships, those who identify as heterosexual, far more than it would affect those in same-sex relationships or who identify as gay or lesbian. Um, and that's just because there are so many more heterosexuals. And they ha also have messy-looking families. And I think that there is a lot of fear of the notion of three legal parents because of what it would open up in all of family law, not just the family law that um, we think of in the formation from the start of families where um, biology is uh, not the, the sole or even primary determinant of who it is who's a parent. Um, and I think that's why there's been significant r resistance to the notion of a child having more than two parents. That said, we are seeing um, an increasing number of model statutes um, and, of course, a statute specifically in California allowing for more than two parents. We have a law passed just in the last couple of weeks in Ontario, Canada, allowing for up to four legal parents of a child um, when that is the intent of up to four individuals um, before the child is born. Uh, so th there's room to believe there'll be some um, uh, movement in that direction, but um, I'd love to have Courtney comment on it also. Her vantage point. Sure. I mean, so the reality is, is that many, many children have more than two adults in their lives who are playing important caregiving functions. And while the states um, are not quickly recognizing this reality, states are beginning to understand that they do have to recognize this reality. And as Nancy said, we have a couple of states now, um, California, Maine, also Delaware and D.C., have statutory provisions that allow courts in some circumstances to find that more than two people are a child's legal parent. Um, we also have a number of additional states that allow a court to find that a child has two legal parents plus an additional um, equitable parent who at least has a right to maintain a relationship with the child. Um, and as Nancy said, we're seeing some potential movement with respect to model and uniform laws. I'm the reporter for the revisions to the Uniform Parentage Act. Nancy is a reporter, uh, an observer on that project. And we are currently grappling with this particular question, whether the Uniform Parentage Act should expressly permit more than two people to be a child's legal parent. Um, and the current draft that we are um, working from does allow a court to find more than two legal parents. I don't know where we'll end up, we'll have to see, um, but uh, it is a very real issue that policymakers are going to have to continue to grapple with going forward. So we're coming to the end of our time. Um, as we end, I wanna uh, encourage uh, folks to check out the Williams Institute's website. Um, there are upcoming Williams Institute uh, events, including the annual Jazz Brunch on January 15th in Los Angeles. Our, our annual moot court competition is scheduled for February 4th uh, at UCLA School of Law, and we're currently looking for lawyers and judges um, to help us with that event. Um, so we would uh, appreciate your support. Um, those events are in Los Angeles, but as you'll see on our website, we also have events around the country, including in New York and D.C., um, so we thank everyone for joining us for this webinar. Again, the webinar will be available on the Williams Institute website next week. The website address, is, uh, as well as other contact information for the Williams Institute, is on the final slide that's showing now. Um, and we'd like to thank 
specifically uh, Nan Hunter and Nancy Polikoff, not only for taking the time to share their thoughts with us today, but for the enormous contributions they've made to both legal scholarship and litigation strategy uh, around the rights of LGBT people, including LGBT parents. Um, it's a real honor to be with them today to celebrate this article and reflect on it. And I want to thank um, Professor Courtney Jocelyn and Professor Kim Pearson, um, two experts in the field, um, two people that we both have uh, learned a lot from today and continue to learn a lot from, and thank them for their contribution here and their contribution to the field. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us, um, and thank you to the Williams Institute for their uh, coordination of this event, and we look forward to being with you all soon. Thank you.